Hi guys! Welcome to week four of Chip Away at a Chapter Book. This week we're going to read The Ninth Ward by Jewel Parker Rhodes. It's a historical fiction book and it's about a girl, 12 year old girl, who lives in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans and what happens to her and her family and friends when Hurricane Katrina hits. The reason it's historical fiction is because even though the story itself about the girl is not a true story, Things that happened in here did happen, like Hurricane Katrina. So we call that historical fiction or realistic fiction. Are you excited? Here we go. One thing I do want to mention about the book is that it's divided into sections. So we are not going to be reading um, chapter to chapter. We are just going to be reading an even amount of pages each day of the week, okay? The author dedicated this book to all the children who experienced Hurricane Katrina and when the lev levees broke in New Orleans. Sunday. They said I was born with a call, a skin netting covering my face like a glove. My mother died birthing me. I would have died too if Mama Yaya hadn't sliced the membrane from my face. I let out a wail when she parted the call, letting in first air, first light. Every year on my birthday, Mama Yaya tells me the same story. Lanisha, your eyes were the lightest green, with the tiniest specks of yellow. With them eyes and that call, I knew you'd have the sight. Mama Yaya smacks her lips and laughs. Afterwards, we always have cake. Chocolate. Today I'm 12. I've eaten three pieces of cake. Mama Yaya's 82. Half blind now, she's still raising me because my relatives won't. I have a whole family full of uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, grandmothers, and whatnot. They live in Uptown, richer than where I live, the Ninth Ward, New Orleans, less than eight miles apart. It might as well be to the moon, or Timbuktu, wherever that is. Mama Yaya says my family is scared of me. Everybody in Louisiana knows there will be spirits walking this earth. All kinds of ghosts you can't see, not unless they want you to. But you, child, you see them. You've got the sight. It's grace to see both worlds, she says as we wash our birthday dishes sticky with bits of jambalaya. Better you be an orphan, your family thinks. Better crazy Mama Yaya raises you, she says, sucking air through her false teeth. Fine, I'm old school. Don't care nothing about folks who dishonor traditions as old as Africa. I'll be your mother and your grandmother both. And she is. I love her more than anything in this whole wide world. I love saying Mama Yaya. Her name sounds so bright and happy, just like Mama Yaya is. And I love how Mama Yaya says my name, Lanisha. Soft with the ah sound going on forever. Lanisha, that's the name my mother gave me, last word she said before she died. I don't remember hearing it, but I imagine she said it then, just like Mama Yaya does now. Upstairs, I sometimes see my mother's ghost on Mama Yaya's bed, her big belly, like she's forgotten she already gave birth to me. Like she's stuck and can't move, like she's forgot that I was already born. Just like my uptown relatives forgot today was my birthday. They always forget. Me and Mama Yaya wrap the leftover cake and foil. Mama Yaya shuffles toward the living room. I follow her like a shadow. We have been together all day long. Gardening, we cut sunflowers for the kitchen table. We chopped ham and onions for the jambalaya. Then we played cards while the rice cooked. I squeezed lemons for lemonade while Mama Yaya frosted the cake. A perfect day. I say... I wish I could see my father. Dead or alive, don't matter. Lanisha, I don't know who he is, or where he is, or if he still is. Your mama died before we could say. Maybe she didn't want to say. Don't know. She weren't but 17. One of them beautiful, light-skinned Fontaine girls, proud of their French heritage, uptown's finest to be sure. I think your mama fell in love with a ninth ward boy. Rich girl, poor boy. He must have been darker too. For you are a fine brown, Lanisha, like pralines. 
Maybe they secretly married like Romeo and Juliet, I say. I like the idea of my parents holding hands, being brave, and exchanging rings. I learned about Romeo and Juliet in school. We don't have Shakespeare plays, just those little booklets that tell us about the plays. Synopsis, my teacher calls them. I don't believe in Santa Claus anymore, but if I did, I'd ask him to bring me a whole set of Shakespeare books. The real ones, with the real words Shakespeare wrote. Then I wouldn't have to take the smelly bus to the city library. The bus also takes me uptown, but not as far uptown as my relatives live. I think about riding further and further, walking up to their house door and knocking, but I don't. I get scared that they may not answer. Instead, I go to the library and try to read The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. But it's too hard. I looked up tragedy in my pocket dictionary. Mama Yaya gave it to me for my birthday last year. Tragedy, it says. A character is brought to ruin or suffers extreme sorrows. I check out the movie Romeo and Juliet for me and Mama Yaya to watch. Hearing the words in the movie, I still don't understand everything, but I can see Romeo and Juliet's love, see how their families fought. The party scene is my favorite. Juliet is dressed so fine in the prettiest long flowing gown. She wears white angel wings. Romeo wears a silver glittering knight's suit with a sword. They just look at each other from across the room and fall in love. I think that's what happened to my parents too. They must have gone to a party and while the DJ was spinning records, they fell in love. Everybody else cleared the floor watching my folks dance fast, slow, and even hip hop. One day I'll be able to read all of Shakespeare's words and understand everything he's saying, like star-crossed, which doesn't mean star zigzagging across the sky. It means doomed. My parents were star-crossed. That's why I think my mother is still here upstairs, a ghost in Mama Yaya's bed. She's waiting for the day my dad, ghost or not, claims us both. Once we're in the living room and Mama Yaya is settled in her favorite chair, all soft with a blue lap shawl, I say, I memorized some Shakespeare. Want to hear? Course I do. She gives me her full attention. I stand on the old living room carpet, imagining I'm on stage. My hand stretches wide and I imagine speaking to the whole world, even if it's only Mama Yaya watching me. I say, for never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet in her Romeo. Then my hands over my heart, I bow my head. Smiling, Mama Yaya claps long and hard. Oh, Lanisha, your mother and father made magic when they made you. Mama Yaya sits back in her chair. Mama Yaya is so tiny, and the chair almost swallows her. Her feet barely touch the floor. Her hair is silver, and her skin reminds me of a walnut, all wrinkly brown. On the wall above her head is a picture of her favorite president, William Jefferson Clinton. Mama Yaya closes her eyes. She does that a lot now. She reminds me of a clock winding down. Her head tilts. Her body relaxes in the chair like a balloon losing air. I take out my birthday gift, a package of sparkly pens Mama Yaya has given me. I pull out the purple ink pen and I write, Romeo plus Juliet equals me. Ten times. I like practicing cursive. It makes me feel grown. Lanisha Mama Yaya. There she is practicing her cursive. I like watching Mama Yaya sleep. Sometimes she twitches with dreams. If I wanted to wake her, all I'd need to say is Oprah, and she'd be wide awake, hollering for her Coke bottle glasses and for me to turn on the TV. But we celebrated a lot today. She should rest. Every day this summer, we watched Oprah. Mama Yaya says, Oprah is a Southern girl. That's why she's got so much sense. I like it when Oprah laughs and when she talks about love. I think she must love everybody she knows. I always wonder, if she knew me, would she love me? This I know for certain. Mama Yaya loves me as the day is long. She is the only one who loves me through and through. When I'm too dreamy, when I don't finish my chores, when I'm grumpy and sad, Mama Yaya just hugs me for a long time. Even when she scolds, she finishes with a hug. 
When she holds me that close, I can always smell Mama Yaya's Vicks Rub in Evening in Paris perfume. Vicks Rub comes in a green bottle and smells of eucalyptus and menthol. It smells cool and tickles my nose. Even in Paris, in Evening in Paris is in a midnight blue bottle and smells warm like trees mixed with magnolias. It seems like the two would smell bad together, but they don't. No one makes Evening in Paris anymore. Soon, it'll be all used up, like me, Mama Yaya says every day, dabbing perfume behind her ears. I always shake my head. This morning, though, Mama Yaya frowned at the mirror like she could see some other world inside it. <sighs> Mr. Death is losing patience. He'll come and ferry me down the Mississippi. I'll put on my feathered hat, wave like I'm in a Mardi Gras parade. I don't like to hear Mama Yaya talk like that. Mama Yaya's chin is on her chest. She is fast asleep, dreaming. I put my purple pin back inside the plastic case. I stroke Mama Yaya's hand. Her head lifts. Her eyes flutter. Mama Yaya, let me help you to bed, I say. You are a good child. She pats my cheek. Did you have a good day? A good birthday day? Yes, ma'am. It was a good day. Mama Yaya leans on my right arm. Her cane is shiny ebony with an ivory skull on top. Her fingers wrap around that skull for dear life. We walk slowly, inch by inch, step by step to her small bedroom. My mother's ghost is gone. Her bed is a high four-poster with white sheets and yellow quilt. Lace curtains hang limp over the two front windows. There isn't any breeze, just stuffy heat and fading sun. Striped green wallpaper covers the walls. On the nightstand is a glass for her false teeth and blood pressure pills, cod liver oil, and rosemary leaves. She puts the rosemary in tea to calm her arthritis. Mama Yaya's altar is in the far corner. It's a small table filled with flickering candles and statues of Catholic saints and voodoo gods. Her rosary crosses silver with sparkling blue beads. Next to a plate offering the gods beans and rice is her black midwife bag. The bag is never opened, and it never moves. But I know Mama Yaya still touches her bag. She keeps it cleaned, locked with all her birthing stuff inside, always ready. I slip Mama Yaya's black clod hopper shoes off her tiny feet. I should be putting you to bed, she says. It's my turn, I say, smiling. Sides, I never had a baby doll. Mama Yaya chuckles. Are you saying I'm a baby doll? I burst out laughing. No, ma'am. My cheeks are warm. The thought of Mama Yaya as an overgrown doll tickles me. Got you, I say. You sure did, Lanisha. Me, a baby doll. Ha! Go on now. I can take care of myself. Me, a baby doll. Mama Yaya is puttering, taking her nightgown out of the drawer and laying her glasses on the nightstand. She is grinning and muttering, baby doll. Big wind-up toy. Chatty Kathy. She is happy, laughing. Night, Mama Yaya. She doesn't hear me. I skip across the hall to my room, happy that I made Mama Yaya laugh. I plop down on my bed. I love my room. This summer, Mama Yaya let me paint, paint the walls different shades of blue. One wall is robin's egg blue. Another, ocean blue another blue sky, and the wall behind my headboard is blueberry. I used a rolling brush, and it was easy as rolling pie dough, back and forth, up and down, turn around, roll the roller in the pan, back and forth, up and down, over and over and over. My hands were blue for a week, pieces of my hair too. I didn't mind. I lie back and stretch. The ceiling is bright white, like my bed sheets and comforter. I promised Mama Yaya I wouldn't get ink on the sheets or dirt on the comforter. And I haven't. It's the prettiest room in the whole house. My room does have puzzle pictures on the wall. I like tiny puzzle pieces with colors on them. I like trying to figure out where they fit. Mama Yaya and I have finished several puzzles together, and some I've done all on my own. Afterwards, I glue the pieces together and hang them on the wall. There is a puzzle picture of wildflowers. 
all yellow, red, orange, and white in a field. There is a picture of a monkey, too, hanging upside down from a tree. My favorite is the picture of a steamboat churning up the Mississippi. I think I'd like traveling by water. Unlike dirt, water seems alive, moving and shifting, always making lapping sounds against the boat and shore. On the right wall above my dresser, I have a picture of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, all lit up with lights. I like it because it looks like a Christmas tree. It took me months to fit all those itty-bitty pieces of light into something beautiful. Outside, the sun is turned from orange to purple. I still have math to finish. It's the third week of school, and I want to get ahead. I grab my math book. I love flipping through the pages. Squiggly marks everywhere. Plus, equal, less than, greater than, alphabet letters, numbers. Since I was at least three, Mama Yaya said, Signs everywhere, Lanisha. Pay attention. And I did. Do. I learned three apples could be the number three. In math, the apples can even be a Y or an X. Squiggly marks can be symbols, a sign for something that is more than it is. If I was blind, I could even rub my fingers over dots. Braille, it's called. Raised dots like pink candy and white sheets. I can tell you what elevator button to push or what doors lead to the girl's bathroom or tell you the story like the three little pigs. My new English teacher, Miss Perry, and my math teacher, Miss Johnson, both talk about symbols. Signs. Romeo plus Juliet. Words and math signs mixed. But I like Mama Yaya signs the best. Ladybugs mean good luck. The Little Dipper means freedom. Its handle is the North Star. The color blue means strength and friendliness. Happiness. Whenever Mama Yaya talks about colors, she'll put her hands on her hips, cock her head, and tease. Who loves blue in this house? Me, I always say. Doing laundry, cooking, cleaning, Mama Yaya keeps teaching me every day. Dreaming about alligators means trouble, she said this morning. Numbers mean something, too. Not just math, Lanisha. Three means life. Eight means power. Four means hard work in this here world the material world. Put them together and they can mean something else. She smacks her gums. Put four and eight together and it equals twelve. That's spiritual strength. Real strength, Lanisha. Some people doubt it because they can't see it on the outside, like butterflies. To most folks, they seem delicate. But the truth is, butterflies keep changing no matter what, going from ugly worm to hard cocoon to strong wings. Always look for the signs, Lanisha, she said. Even flowers. Magnolias mean dignity, beauty. Magnolia trees grow all over our neighborhood. The big trees with their buttery white petals bloom sweet all spring. If Mama Yaya were a flower, I'm pretty sure she would be a magnolia. I lean back into my pillows, taking out the purple pen and writing in my math book. Me, Lanisha. 12. 8 plus 4 equals 12. All marks, signs, written in my best cursive. Symbols of me. Who cares about a stupid uptown family? Mama Yaya plus Lanisha equals love. I heart me like a butterfly. I am strong. Monday. I do see ghosts. Have since I was an itty-bitty baby. Ghosts. Here now. Always. They're soft, wispy. I can put my hand through them. If I blow hard enough, I can make them shiver. Ghosts don't frighten me. Most of them just look lost, like they can't understand what happened to them. Their eyes blank with their ghost bodies wandering about. When I was younger, I used to think they were just old and older ghosts. But in school, we've been studying New Orleans history, and now I can spot differences better. Ghosts wearing yellow silk ball gowns with flowers in their hair and waving silk fans. Cool men wearing slanted hats and make them look slick and tapping rhythms with their brown and white suede shoes. Ghosts wearing jeans and colored beads like they wear during Mardi Gras. They carry signs, make love, not war. Their fingers make a V, the peace sign. Now, ghosts in baggy pants, their underwear showing, 
wearing short sleeve t-shirts and body tattoos, are from my time. They're mostly boys killed in drive-bys or fights or robberies. Sometimes I know them from school, like Jermaine. One day I'm seeing him in the cafeteria eating macaroni, and the next day he's a ghost, dull-eyed, high-fiving me, saying, Hey, Lanisha. I always answer, hey, even if he was mean to me when he was alive. Every morning since I started my new school, Jermaine's ghost waits for me on the school steps. He should be starting middle school with the rest of us. Instead, he sits on the steps watching everyone pass by. Jermaine used to skip school lots. His last skip, he was at a 7-Eleven buying a soda. He got a belly shot. Wrong place, wrong time. He never got to graduate. I always wave at him. Sometimes he says, you're cool, Lanisha. Other times, stay in school. As if I wouldn't. I don't remind him that he used to make fun of my green yellow eyes and call me evil eye or devil eye and make ooh scary movie sounds whenever I walked by. Kids at school have always teased me. Crazy Lanisha, spooky Lanisha, witch Lanisha. I just tried to ignore them. They make me feel bad and sometimes I even cry. Still, I don't tell them that if they're shot dead or drowned in the swamp or smashed by a car that they'll be glad I can see them. I'll remind them of home, of being alive. Sometimes the teasing is just too much, though, and I go into the girls' bathroom to hide. When I'm sad, I think of Mama Yaya. I see her in my mind like she's a ghost and it comforts me. You are loved, Lanisha, she always says. Lanisha, you are always loved. Tayshawn, my neighbor from down the street, is in my English class. Every time I see Tayshawn, I get the feeling that we're related. After all, Mama Yaya helped birth us both. Except Tayshawn's mother still lives. Mine died, and I was born first. Mama Yaya doesn't birth babies anymore. Everybody goes to charity hospital. Tayshawn, the last baby she birthed, was born with extra fingers. Two little bumps growing out of the sides of his hands. Mama Yaya tried to tell everyone it was a good sign, saying he'll cling hard to life. Before Taishan was born, another baby had died. Born premature, Mama Yaya said, because of you, said the pitiful mother. It was easier for everyone to believe the mother, to doubt the strength of Mama Yaya's roots and herbs. Then there'd be me, born with a call, the ignorant say, which is spawn. One baby died, one born with a call, and one trying to grow 12 fingers. It was enough for all the would-be mothers to go to charity hospital. No time for a midwife anymore. When I see Tayshan on the street, I wave. He's a sad boy. Picked on all the time, even though his dad sliced off the extra skin on his hands when he was born. Now he has small stumps where his extra fingers used to be. His dad works hard all day at the wharf. His mama, Mrs. Williams, cleans at the Riverwalk Casino, daytime, nighttime, overtime. Any time I can get, Mrs. Williams chuckles. Nights when she isn't working, she sings gospel at the New Life Church a few blocks over. Tayshan keeps so quiet, and I think his parents forget he's there. But I think he keeps quiet because, like a ghost, he doesn't want to be noticed. He's short, shorter than all the sixth grade girls. Every year in every grade, he's been the shortest kid. Every year in every grade, he has had a far-off far look, like he doesn't see what's up close, just what's far, like treetops or where the ground meets the sky. Tayshan slides around the halls, keeping still on the schoolyard. The ghosts see him. I wish he could see them. In class, Tayshan doesn't look at the blackboard. Sometimes he plays tic-tac-toe by himself. Other times he hums, and when the boys hear him, they so sometimes smack his head. Most times he stares out the window past the safety bars to his own world. At school, I don't say, hey, Tayshawn, because I'd only make his teasing worse. It isn't fair. Whenever I see how sad and lonely, ta lonely Tayshawn is, it makes me doubt Mama Yaya is right about him clinging hard to life. But I keep faith. Like Mama Yaya keeps faith in me. When the time's right, Mama Yaya always says, the universe shines down love. 
Mama Yaya says, There are more good signs in this world, Lanisha, than bad. In school, I think my teachers count for more goodness than a trillion kids teasing me. Even though I'm teased, my new middle school feels good. Miss Perry, my Teach for America English teacher, is wearing yellow, and yellow means peace. Class, she says today. Today's vocabulary word is fortitude, strength to endure. I like that word. I like how when saying it, my tongue touches the top of my teeth. Can you do that? Fortitude. I look across at Taishan. I'm surprised. He's listening to Miss Perry, too. Maybe, like me, Taishan loves words, too. Fortitude is three syllables. Three is a powerful number. It means life. It means making peace with your thoughts, words, and deeds. I can't wait to tell Mama Yaya my new word. Tuesday. The next day I think about all Mama Yaya has told me. Signs everywhere. Pay attention. And I do. Noticing that the flowers on the way to school seem thirsty. Noticing that our school is old and crumbling. But it is always feeling brand new because the blackboard changes. Chalk. Red, blue, white, and green is powerful. Sending me signals. I watch as my math teacher, Miss Johnson, tries to help Andrew understand her signs. Math signs. Miss Johnson explains again and again, ever so careful. Kind. Andrew always gets stuck on questions like, how come y equals x plus c? Why not z? How come water boils? Why didn't Lincoln play cards instead of going to see a show? Every year we've been in school together, they pass him, even though grown-ups say he's slow. In school, he's no trouble. Folks say, school gives his mother a babysitter so she can work. I don't believe that. Andrew is just different smart. Like if you say, the world is flat, Andrew's mind cuts it up into squares, like the way my eyes see things that others swear aren't there. Usually I just don't say anything. I do my work and I keep my head down. But today, my third day being 12, I whisper to Andrew, I'll help. At lunch, I'll show you what why numbers and letters mean. Mean what? asked Andrew. His eyes are brown and curious. He acts as if I've been talking to him all these years, but I haven't. Like Tayshawn, I don't want him to get teased more for talking to me. At my new school, I see only popular kids hanging in twos and threes or in groups. Sometimes they all wear short black skirts or have their hair braided with the same color beads or laugh at kids like me, Andrew, and Tayshawn. Mean what? asks Andrew, his fingers tapping my desk. Quantity. Numbers are signs for how much. Andrew smiles polite. The bell rings. I say, come on. Our schoolyard is nothing but concrete with an old handball wall and fading basketball lines. Most kids stand around looking bored. Me, I usually bring a book to keep me company. Today I have Andrew. Andrew who usually just stays inside. We sit at a rusty picnic table. The sun is warming us good. I glare at anyone walking by, daring them to tease us. I must have an invisible sign that says, Don't mess with Lanisha, because no one says anything. Or maybe everyone's shocked to see Andrew outside. Math problems, I say. Andrew looks at me. He has freckles on his nose. His t-shirt has a hole, and when he shifts, I can see his belly button. Behind Andrew, I see a skinny ghost with a beard and a bow tie. I wonder if it's a teacher from long ago. I draw the numbers 5 plus 5 and 6 plus 6 and 7 plus 7. Then I write 5 times 2, 6 times 2, 7 times 2. Are these the same? Is 5 plus 5 the same as 2 times 5? Andrew blinks. I think the problems are easy, but Andrew doesn't have an answer. I try again. Here, I say, count these. I draw little sticks to add up ten. Andrew blinks again. I don't need math. Math doesn't need me. Then he scoots closer and leans in like he's going to tell me a secret. He whispers, Do you know why there's air? 
So you can breathe, I answered. He nods. So we can live, he says. Can't see it, but it's always there. He sucks in air and his cheeks hollow like a skeleton. Inside, he points at his chest. Then he opens his mouth wide and blows his air out like he's pretending to be the big bad wolf. He grins and laughs loudly. Me and Andrew high five. See, Andrew is smart. Different smart. The ghost puts up a hand for a high five, but I ignore him. We sit comfortable. Andrew shows me the ants crawling across the table. Look at them breathe, he says. I answer, Mama Yaya would like you. Then I add, she doesn't need math either. But I do, I think. Mama Yaya never went to school. Her mother taught her and her mother's mother taught her mother. I need everything Mama Yaya teaches me. And I need everything that school teaches me too. I need all the signs, dreams, words, word problems, math. Like air, they make my mind breathe. The bell rings. I pat Andrew's hand. You're smart, Andrew. He ducks his head like a baby bird. Like me, I say. Like me, he crows. We walk back to the classroom, and nobody, I swear, bothers us. After school, my teacher, Miss Johnson, teaches me. On Tuesdays, I try and stay late so we can work on harder problems. Miss Johnson says, Lanisha, you're like a sponge. Sponges are ugly but I think I know what Miss Johnson means. I try to work hard. Mama Yaya says, just because you're smart doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. You have to set your mind to learning, Lanisha, every, each and every day. When I can't solve a problem, I get frustrated, but when I do solve it, I feel like singing, like I don't have any worries in the world. You could be an engineer, Miss Johnson says. Engineers build things, I say, feeling happy, strong. Yes. Like houses, apartments, and such? Mm, more like dams and bridges. Wait. She gets up, digs in her purse. My friend sent me a postcard, she says, handing it to me. A beautiful red bridge rises out of the mist over the water. The Golden Gate. Why is it called that? I don't know. You could find out. It's a suspension bridge. What's that mean? Look it up. You sound like Miss Perry. I will too. Look it up. I know what suspense means, but what does it mean for a bridge? What does it mean in math? My fingers trace the bridge over the Pacific Ocean. It's got to be the Pacific because the front of the card says San Francisco. I stare at the photograph. My heart races. I feel tingly inside. The bridge is beautiful. I could do that, I think, build bridges. I love how they look, like strong steel butterflies soaring high. My first bridge would be from the Lower Ninth Ward to Uptown New Orleans. If I built a beautiful bridge to my family, maybe they'd walk across? Or else, let me? I walk home slowly from school. Miss Johnson's postcard is in my jeans back pocket. She let me have it, even though the card had writing. It said, Dear Evelyn, you should be here. Love, Jim. I didn't know her name was Evelyn. The sky is bright blue like marbles with cloudy eyes. The end of summer is hurricane season, but the weather feels just fine. It is like that sometimes. Calm, then rain hits. I stop and smell. I smell fish, brine from the Gulf, algae from the Mississippi, and somebody frying catfish. I smell something else. Old, sorrowful. I don't know what it is. I must ask Mama Yaya. She says, senses tell you everything. See, touch, smell, feel. Trust your senses and you'll never lose your way. Only difference is Mama Yaya's lived a long time. Her senses have told her so much and I know so little. I'm only 12 and I still have lots to learn. I keep walking, sniffing the air, imagining bridges in the sky. I can already picture metal and wires making marks shaping against the sky. I think fitting the pieces together would be like a jigsaw puzzle, except it wouldn't be cardboard pasted together and hung on a wall. It'd be useful with patterns, shapes that did something, 
helped people and cars cross the street, over water, or a deep hole in the ground. Making bridges would be magic. Math would be my special trick. I'd only make beautiful bridges, I think, as strong and delicate as butterflies. I hear cursing and crying. Hey, I shout. Some boys are dragging someone into the alley, taunting, kicking, punching. A dog barks. I hear, stop it. I hate bullies. Hey, I push at one boy. He turns, but when he sees it's me, he doesn't hit. I am Mama Yaya's crazy girl. What y'all doing? I know these boys, Eddie, Max, and Levon. Mind your own business, said Max. He puffs out his chest, acting tough. He has always been a thug. I go toe to toe. I puff my chest out, too. I still don't know who they've been picking on. I keep my eyes focused on Max. You want to fight me, I say. No boy likes to be dared by a girl. If he takes me up on it, I'm dead. I hear crying, and I know whoever they've been picking on is going to be no help. Why would I fight a girl? Waste of time. Yeah, says Eddie. Max scowls at him to shut up. Max hasn't moved and his black eyes look over me. Go home, Lanisha, Max says. It ain't Halloween. Eddie and Levon coo cackle with laughter. Max is giving high fives. Your mama, I say. Everyone goes quiet. Max looks fierce, like he wants to punch me. Say it, I say. Max is supposed to say, your mama, back. But no one messes with Mama Yaya. She may cast a spell on him. Of course, she'd do no such thing. She don't do spells. Wouldn't hurt a bug. But Max don't know that. You have skinny legs, skinny butt, skinny everything, he says. No wonder no boy likes you. You ugly. He stretches out ugly like a moan. I don't mind. It's part of the game. Max keeps a little pride, and I get what I want. I turn my back and look to see who's been being picked on. Tayshawn! His eye is swollen and his arms wrapped around a dirty dog. Go on, I say to Max, Eddie, and Levon. Pick on someone else. They was kicking the dog, screams Tayshawn. Dog didn't hurt nobody. Kids at school whisper, Max once set a cat on fire. You're just a girl, not worth my time. I ball my fist, and you're just stupid, dumber than a rock. I want Max to fight me. Go on, hit her, says Levon. Yeah, says Eddie, his eyes bugging out like balloons. Max blinks, his eyes are super black, mean. Come on, Max says, waste of time. Him, Eddie, and Levon walk away trying to be cool. I can finally breathe. Thanks, says Tayshawn. He pats the dog and the dog licks him. It's the first time I've seen Tayshawn smile, a big, wide smile that shows his teeth. The dog looks at me its tongue lolling. It's a mess, matted hair, more black than brown, big paws, but its body is still small. It's still a pup with bulging brown eyes and short, rangy hair. Tayshan is loving the dog like there's no tomorrow. He tried to save me. Did you see? He should have stopped you from getting that black eye then. What is it? Some kind of lab terrier mix? German Shepherd, says Tayshan defiant. I think no way, but I let it pass. Come on, Mama Yaya will fix your eye. I gotta get home. Start the rice. Tayshan's mother gets home at six. Later, I say. Can you keep Spot for a while? Who, I say? Spot, my dog. Your dog doesn't have any spots. So, please, Lanisha, can you keep him? My mama won't let me keep him. Another mouth to feed, she'll say. This is the most I've ever heard Tayshan say. Well, how did you find him? He found me. See, says Tayshan, gritting, getting up, his pants baggy and scratched, his face bruised. He's got no collar, no tags. He's a stray and he found me. I think Tayshan is a stray. Like me, he doesn't have friends. I read books to do homework. Tayshan just walks the neighborhood in his own world or sits on his porch staring out. Once I saw him trying to make an ant colony, filling a mason jar with dirt. I asked him if he needed help, but he said no, turning his back to me. So, in the neighborhood, I pretty much leave him alone. Please, Lanisha, help me. I know he's not a German shepherd. I just always wanted one. I look at Tayshan. 
hard. Really see him. His eyes are brown, just like the dog's. He's nice looking. Kind, I think. He has a kind face. He's tiny, though, smaller than most girls. Panting, the dog, he seems happy. Seeing Taishan's feelings on his face, I see him. Please. All right, but Mama Yaya might say we should call the dog catcher. No, she won't. How do you know? I just do. He is one happy boy and I smile. Then I whistle and call, come on, Spot. And the dog does, trailing beside me, his stump of a tail high. I have seen much prettier dogs, but Spot doesn't seem to mind being ugly. Looky here, says Mama Yaya as we walk through the door. Is that Spot? I am exasperated. I learned that word from my dictionary. Exasperated, as in annoyed. Spot lies down at Mama Yaya's feet like he belongs there. I am exasperated, but not surprised. Mama Yaya knows everything. She has the sight, too. She gives both me and Spot a bowl of Hop and John. I look around the warm kitchen as we eat. The gas stove, the dinette set, mason jars filled with roots and herbs on the counter. Mama Yaya is humming a sweet tune, some song from her African past from another life. Spot is snoring slightly at her feet. When we finish, I do the dishes, watching rainbow bubbles float out from the stink sink. You know... There's a storm coming, says Mama Yaya as I slip the last clean dish on the rack, my hands dripping with water. There's been nothing on the radio or the TV news, nothing in the papers, but Mama Yaya knows. By the end of the week, I shrug. We've had storms before. Tayshan's coming too, she says. I'm always still surprised how Mama Yaya can see people coming before they even get here. Sometimes I think she has more powers than any superhero. There's a rat-tat-tat on the door. Lanisha, it's me, Tayshan. Spot gets up, wagging his whole body. I look up, drying my hands. Y'all clean that dog before bed, says Mama Yaya. Come on, I say to Tayshan. Tayshan, opening the door, then moving down the steps around the side of the house. Tayshan spots Pat's spot. I always wanted a dog. I say nothing. Just grab the hose and spray Spot and Tayshan both. One shouts, the other howls, both are happy. It is hot and the water is cold. I toss Tayshan a bar of soap and he's scrubbing Spot. I think they both are getting cleaner than they've ever been. Spot licks Tayshan's face and Tayshan grins. Neighbors pass by. Mrs. Watson cries, that's one fine dog, just a pup. Mr. Lincoln, who has a fake left foot, he says his flesh foot is buried in Vietnam, shouts, Wash him once, then twice, three times clean. Fleas don't like soap. Mr. D, Mama Yaya's friend, a retired cop, hoots. Who's your new friend, Lanisha? I look around to see who he's talking about. It's Tayshan. Tayshan shakes himself, and when he does it, Spot shakes himself too, spraying water like streamers. Tayshan does it again, and so does Spot. A trick already, exclaims Mr. D. You got a smart friend, Lanisha. Mr. D waddles away, his belly jiggling like jelly over his belt. I don't tell him Tayshan is our neighbor from across the street. Whoop, 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 I scream, holding the hose high than low. Spot barks. Soon, him and Tayshan are jumping up and down, trying to escape the water snake. High, then low. Spot tries to bite the water. Tayshan, one eye still closed, just laughs and laughs. I spray his sneakers and Spot's toes. I wave at Rudy and Rodriguez. They live in the blue shotgun house down the block. Rudy calls, Lanisha, spray some here, too. I do, and the two grown men laugh like Tayshan, jumping back, yet jumping forward enough to make sure their shirts and hair get wet. Feels good, says Rodriguez. Our neighborhood rain machine. He tosses a silver dollar to Tayshan. Buy the dog a bone. Tayshan, his arms open wide, twirls like an airplane. Spot barks and chases his tail. I lift the hose high. Water falls like a soft summer shower. There is sweetness to this day. I thought this day was going to be ordinary, but it was full of new surprises. Andrew, Tayshan, and Spot, and Miss Johnson saying I could be an engineer. 
I look up and down the street. Most, folk, most folks are outside. None of the houses have air conditioning. The houses are painted in pastel colors, pink, yellow, blue, and green. A few are white. Only our house is peach. Pastel colors are supposed to be cool, but all of us are sweating just the same. I hear Mama Yaya's TV news floating yakety yak out the windows. A tropical storm is kicking up high waves in the Bahamas. Satellites show the clock counterclockwise rotation of a developing hurricane. Winds 38 miles per hour. I hear someone blowing a saxophone. I hear some boys hollering for pickup basketball. Others are rapping on the corner, pretending they aren't on TV. Girls are playing jacks and double dutch. The older ones are sitting on porch porches, gossiping, braiding each other's hair, and looking at old copies of Essence magazine. Grown-ups are arriving home from work. They seem like kids again, grinning silly. Their wrinkly faces go all smooth once they park their cars or step down from the city bus. Men take off their jackets like they're slipping off backpacks, and women swing their purses like empty lunch boxes. Retired folks walk through the neighborhood trying to be helpful. They scold kids to walk, not run, across the street. I spray Tayshawn's big feet. Spot barks. I'm happy. I think this neighborhood is my family. Right here. Now. Who needs a dumb uptown family? We're going to stop there. I will see you tomorrow for day two. I hope you're enjoying Ninth Ward so far. See you soon.